keys for today's lesson. Woohoo! We actually got some wisdom to learn. Well, isn't today's lesson actual wisdom stuff rather than just telling us to get wisdom? It actually gives us something that we can learn to apply some wisdom to. Don't, you don't have to agree with me. It's good to see you too. <laughs> I really miss being with you. Uh, but it is a lesson that deals primarily with what? What's that? Drinking and and what? Gluttony, drug abuse. That kind of ties in with alcohol, but also gluttony. These are two areas that we could exercise wisdom in. Again, not to go beating on a drum. So much of the time here from Proverbs, we have been hearing, get wisdom. Wisdom about what? About what? About what? Yeah, we've dealt with it. Be wise about your relationship with God. There are a lot of areas in our lives that we can exercise wisdom, and these are two very important ones. Alcohol and also gluttony. What is alcohol? It's a drink that makes you drunk. It's a drink that makes you drunk. <laughs> I like that definition. But in reality, it goes back to Deb's comment, alcohol is a drug. It's a drug. What do drugs do? They do what? Ruin your mind. And your body. And so the Bible offers warnings about it. I, I know that here about two weeks ago, I was doing a one of my Bible study things over at care facility. They bring the residents in, but they really scatter the residents out. I mean, the residents are not allowed to sit next to each other. And one of the residents asked me about drinking. And I told her, I says, I don't at all. She says, you mean you've never? I says, no, I've never. I said, but I do remember one time in high school, one of the kids in the band gave me some um, hot chocolate that had, had some alcohol in it. I could taste it. I told him, I said, don't ever do that again. You drank it? Well, I didn't know that it was in it until I tasted it. He didn't tell me ahead of time it was in it. After you drank it. Right, I could tell after I tasted it, all it took was one mouthful. I don't know what it was, but but it was definitely alcohol. And so I told him, I, you know, don't ever do that again. David um, was in a wreck on the other day. The guy in front of him took the telephone pole, knocked it down onto David. And uh, when the police got there, they asked the man if he'd been drinking. He said, I only had 500 drinks, and I know I'm drunk, but nobody got hurt. That's, David was caught or got mangled up pretty bad, but he was right behind the guy. Oftentimes, the person that gets hurt is the person that wasn't drinking. In fact, too many times, it's the person that wasn't drinking that actually gets killed. Because when you're inebriated, your reflexes are slow, and you don't tense up, and your body just kind of gets thrown around and rolls with the punches. We're just thankful we didn't get David. Amen. Well, back to the story I went in to say to this lady, I says, I've seen alcohol in the life of somebody in my family. I said, I've got a nephew. He doesn't have a dad. And the dad's still living. But I said, it's ruined his dad's life. I says, I as a minister have seen too many people that mess around with that. And they deny, they deny that it's ruining their lives. Everybody else can see it except for them. Is that true? oftentimes true? Oh, I could quit any time I want to. Can they? That's the same. If they can, sure. do it. Do us all a favor. Quit. You're 
you're ruining your life. And more than likely, you're not just ruining your life. No man is an island. Your life is ruining other people's lives. Amen? Amen. So I gave this lady a rather lengthy explanation to her simple question. And she looked at me and she says, I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> I wasn't. Because my stance has always been the same. Stay away from it. I was told when I was growing up that when does a person become an alcoholic after one drink? We now know that a person can become an alcoholic before they even take the first drink. If they're a baby born to an alcoholic mother, the chemical is already in the baby's bloodstream and that baby will have a natural propensity to indulge in alcohol. So this lesson today is finding, yes, Turtle. I make a promise to my mom and also to myself and also to my dad that I will not drink or smoke. And that's good. And you want to finish telling the story how they had a gun pointed at your head? <laughs> no. Uh, no. They didn't have a gun pointed at his head, but it is. It's a very wise thing. I know this uh, old saying. When I've told you folks this before, it didn't make any sense to you. I'll tell it to you again because I always give the explanation. I don't know if you ever remember or not. I have never seen Jesus turn water into wine, but I have seen wine <coughs> turned into furniture. You seen wine wine? Turned into furniture. Oh, I've told you this at least two different times, and you seem as confused now as then. <laughs> what do I mean by wine turned into furniture? You ever been to an alcoholic's house and they don't have a stick of furniture in the house? Why don't they have a stick of furniture in the house? Because they drank it all up. You can take that wine and you can actually convert it into something that is useful for the family. And I know that we got people in our class that have had deals with that. Does it help a person's life? No. Why does the person do it? I guess it tastes good. It's more pleasure. They may say it's taste. But it doesn't taste good. You take a you take a sip of that, it's gross. They say that it tastes good. I think that the major reason they do it is back to the beginning of our conversation. It is a drug. It makes a person feel good. Why is there such a big problem with pornography these days? Pornography is a drug. Why do I say it is a drug? People say it, it's not a drug. It's, it's just something that you see with your eyes. What does it do to a person whenever they see the pornography? I'll get to you in a second, Turtle. Right. What does it do to a person when they see it? Why, why do people, why do people, they enjoy it. It's a drug. It makes a person feel good. It arouses them. And as Dr. James Dobson was talking about 20 years ago, the problem with it is, it's just like other drugs, whether it's alcohol or whether it's drugs that people take. Pretty soon, what used to give you your high doesn't give you the high anymore. And the pornography addicts, they will progress from one level of pornography to the next level of pornography to get, isn't that what happens with alcohol? You go from the milder stuff to something that is stronger. Isn't it what happens with people taking drugs? They progress from light doses of it to heavier doses of it. It's a progressive 
Yeah, but one time I did take a sip of, of my dad's beer and I, first thing I thought, spit it out. It tastes nasty. And I'm going to go ahead and throw this out too. Smoking. It's what? A drug. A drug. I say, no, it's not a drug. I just enjoy the, the, the smell of smoke in my nose. Everybody says that. Why can't they quit? Because of the drugs that are introduced into the, the cigarettes or whatever that the human body gets addicted to. That's why people have to fight smoking so much. It's, I'm convinced it's not so much the smell of smoke that they miss. It's the chemicals that are placed in the tobacco that they become addicted to those chemicals. There's a chemical addiction. Okay. Well, to I, I never really smoked cigarettes all the time. I quit. When I want to quit, I quit. But a lot of people reach this moment of years, 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 years. She said, she said one day to me, she said, I got to quit. She said, going, Christ is going in the eye for one thing. She said, I think we can use your money for a different reason. But, you know, from the day she said, I quit. She quit. She hadn't smoked a cigarette since, and uh, and um, in fact, she the people that come around us know they if they smoke they get to go outside so they don't want to smell in the house. You know, but you're you're amazed. You can be amazed at how much you smoke people that smoke, and it, it really is that sense in your house. You, you don't even realize it yourself. It's on the floor. It's on your house. Yeah, so you quit smoking. <laughs> She had to go out all her clothes. A lot of reasons of, you know, it was a smoke. She said, I didn't know that. I said, well, maybe. But she, she hadn't smoked for three years. I've had I've had food given to me yeah. from homes yeah. where there was heavy smoking going on. Yeah. But I couldn't eat the food. But the smell it. It's in the food. One of my things is vaping. Vaping is just as bad. There's a real concern about vaping. It's it's worse than a cigarette. And she she vapes. It's and worse I said, than that's a cigarette. Bad. But now it isn't. Well, again, we we're going to get into the lesson. I hope, in fact, this is what I'm almost tempted to do. If you look in your book on page eighty six. You see the box there, yeah. this box here, that's the real heart of today's lesson. It deals with passages of scripture, not just from Proverbs, but it takes you on a tour through the Bible of what the Bible says about gluttony, the warnings against alcohol, the physical effects of alcohol, the mental effects of alcohol, the spiritual effects of alcohol, Cases of people being drunk in the Bible, the alternative to being filled with alcohol, and then finally God has given us bodies in order to honor him. So people end up saying, well, Tim, what have you really been wanting all these lessons from Proverbs? This is it. This is what we need to be studying because it's impacting where people are struggling the most. Is there a problem these days in our society with alcohol? In addictions in general? Yes. Is there a problem with gluttony? Yes. You got a real problem. Purple. Look at the the hot dog eating contest. Yeah. Thanks. And they're doing it to make money. That's why Joey Chestnut does it. I think that this past 4th of July, he ate 75 hot dogs and buns in 10 minutes. I'm lucky. Basically. <laughs> Basically. Well, let's go ahead and go into today's text. If we get a chance, we may want to come back to this on page 86. But let's take a look at today's lesson. 
First passage of scripture, bottom of page 83. Deb, would you like to read it out loud, please? Don't let your heart end be centered. Instead, always fear the Lord, and then you will have a future, and your hope will not be gay. So this first passage of scripture is really kind of one of those general things. Don't end be centered. So, I mean, when you get to looking around of people that you really want to pattern your life after, don't model your life after those that are engaged in sinful activities. It may look like that they're having a lot of fun. You know, back when I was in high school, as a preacher's kid, there was a lot of stuff that I wasn't in, invited to. In fact, if you know my testimony, that was one of the reasons why I said, as I was getting ready to complete high school, that I never wanted to be a preacher. Because I had lived under the stigma of being a preacher's kid all my life. And we got excluded from parties. We got excluded from conversation. You know, we're always told, you can't do such and such because you're a preacher's kid. I got tired of it. As I grew older, though, I became thankful that I was a preacher's kid. Because all those people out there that were having a good time, they pay for it later on. They pay for it. And so this passage of scripture that Deb just read says, don't let your heart envy sinners. Don't, don't be envious of them. Stuff will catch up with them. Um, I don't know. People on the internet may disagree. But I get told all the time that people don't think that I'm as old as I am. I know some people say, well, you just got good genes. My brothers kid me all the time that of all of us, I have the fewest gray hairs, and I have to remind them that I'm not married. <laughs> um, is there value? Is there value to living a godly life? Does it pay off? How many of you could say on the other extreme, people that you know, maybe that you graduated with, and they lived hard all their life? What's the saying? They were rode hard and put away wet. And they look like, what, they're 10 years, 20 years older than what they are? What's that result of? You're going to reap what you sow. Don't envy sinners. You live a godly life, you'll be blessed for it. You'll not regret it. Instead, the writer says, always fear the Lord. Walk a godly life. You and I don't know when we're going to be called home. God can call us home today. We won't have anything to be ashamed of if we've stayed close to him. The writer then says, because if you will stay close to the Lord and you won't any sinners, you will have a future. And your hope won't be dashed. It's good news. Stay on the straight and narrow. You will be blessed for it. Any questions about that first passage of Scripture? All right, let's go to the second passage of Scripture. Who'd like to read it? Sheila, would you? Thank you. Page 84. The petition. Listen, my son, and be wise. Keep your mind on the right course. Don't associate with those who drink too much wine or with those who gorge themselves on meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will become poor, and grog and grogginess will clothe it in rags. Okay, so listen, my son, and be wise. Here we've got a clear instruction about what kind of wisdom we should end up tucking away inside of our heads. Keep your mind on the right course. What's the right course, okay? The right course is not the wrong course. The wrong course is what he outlines here. The wrong course is when a person drinks too much wine or a person that eats too much. Because what? The drunkard and the glutton will become poor and grogginess will clothe them in rags. Let me ask you a question. How do you feel after you've eaten a big meal? Sleepy. Why do you feel sleepy? Because you've ate too much, probably. 
But what physiologically is going on? Yeah, it's too much. Alcohol. Drunk? It's just like alcohol. Drunk on food? Yeah. What'd you say, Becky? I said it's shutting down your cells. Like you're your body is working like crazy to digest this massive amount of food that you just put in your stomach. Your body is working hard to try to do something with all of that stuff. Ask the question. You come home from the grocery store and you carry everything in. You know, you've been out there and I don't know how much groceries you're going to buy. What am I going to do with all this? So you frantically start working like a dog to get stuff put away. You finally get it put away and it's kind of, whoo, that was work. That's what your body goes through when you end up throwing a huge amount of food. Why do we eat so much? Tastes good. Tastes good. Can't get enough of it. Can't get enough of it. I want more and more until I, as my mom says, I'm so full. I can chew, but I can't swallow. <laughs> that goes right back to what you said. It's the chemicals they put in it, and the sugar, and the yeah. salt, is, is in all the foods that we eat. Your body is working not just to digest it, but to try to keep the chemical levels in your body regulated. I mean, when you go to that dessert table, and you end up loading up on all sorts of sugary foods, You've introduced into your body lots and lots of sugar. What is it that ends up breaking down sugar? What breaks it down? I-N-S-U-L-I-N. -S -S Insulin. Insulin. Your body ends up having to produce lots of insulin to break that sugar down. Because if you don't break that sugar down, it's going to destroy your organs. So your body, in order to get that sugar broke down, all of a sudden says, Woo! Emergency, emergency, I've got to release a whole bunch of insulin because this person that's in control of this body just dumped a five-pound bag of sugar down my throat. So your body ends up having to produce all of this insulin to keep your sugar level at a reasonable level. What happens if your sugar level goes too high? You can go into a coma. You can go into a coma. All sorts of things. So yeah, your body is working hard whenever you end up eating. It's, it's not just the digestion, but all of those chemicals in your body. You have just placed in your body an enormous amount of chemicals, and that brain of yours is saying, you know when you go to get your blood work done, they draw the blood, and then you get the report back, and it's got a list of all of these things with regard to your blood. They look at it. If you look at that, sometimes it'll tell you, well, this one's low, this one's high, or whatnot. Your body tries to keep all of those things within a certain range. When you put all the chemicals from the food in your body, it can throw all of those things out of whack, but the computer in your brain says, We've got to get to work here and figure out what to do with all this stuff so that I don't have this person get messed up. Gluttony. It makes you drowsy. It's hard on your body. Uh, what is the best... I'll ask you all this. What is the best weight loss suggestion that you've ever heard? If you want to lose weight. Eat less. Eat less. <laughs> Push away from the table. Years ago, some people may remember, oh, this is probably at least 15 years ago, there was a couple that came to our church from over in Illinois. Bill and Christy Walker. Anybody remember Bill and Christy Walker? He helped us out there on the sidewalk. Why? You remember him? In fact, they lived just down the street from where Hank used to live. But Bill had ended up getting pudgy. And we moved away. Even before he moved away, he says, I gotta do something about my weight. Last time I talked with him, he had lost hundred pounds. And he says, I lost an awful lot of it through walking. 
But this is what he said. If a person wants to lose weight, here's the simplest plan that you'll ever hear in your life. You just have to burn more calories than you consume. If you burn more calories than what you take in, you'll lose weight. Simple as that. The problem is, if you eat a lot, it makes you sit still. And then you don't feel like doing anything. And if you're not doing anything, you're not burning any calories. Right? So the writer here says, I'm going to throw this into you since we're on the subject of the gluttony. What's one of the biggest expenses that couples fail to include in their budgets that just can absolutely wreck their budgets. What are we dealing with subject wise? What? We're dealing with subject of food. Really, I'd say it's a medical bill because we're going to end up sick with this. We're going to have to go either to a weight, a nutritious place, those, get you back on track. Yeah, it's just a cycle. Those things can come up. Medical bills can come up. Those are things that oftentimes we brought on because of our eating habits exactly. and our lack of staying fit. Not saying always, but how many of y'all would agree with that statement? We've heard the doctor so many times say, you need to get more exercise. You need to eat better. And we always do what he tells us to, right? Well, have all of our lives. I mean, we just, we go home and we obsess over what that doctor said. No, it's always tomorrow. In one ear, not the other. I'll do this tomorrow. No, one of the points that I was trying to make is that back when I would work with young couples on trying to set up budgets, the one item that oftentimes they failed to account enough for was their fast food. We live within such a fast-paced society that oftentimes they weren't going to the grocery store because it was so easy to stop by fast food and get, you know, a happy meal or whatever it was. And you'd be surprised if, you, if you've not kept track of it, if you're one of those people, you'd be surprised at the end of the month, how much money you were actually putting out. How much can you spend at a fast food place these days? Full up. <laughs> Enough to buy groceries for a couple of weeks. <laughs> I had someone tell me the other day that they went through and picked up something for somebody. It was over $10. Yeah just for that one person. Well, they make it too easy. The they, they make it too easy, but again, again, looking back at this, don't associate with those who drink too much or with those who forge themselves on meat for the drunken and the glut will become poor. Nobody They'll become poor. Nobody forces us to stop at that fast food. No. That's our decision. It is our decision, but I'm hoping that you're focusing on my emphasis. It's not just physically what eating a lot does to us. It's the fact that it leaves people without the money necessary in order to take care of their needs. It will end up putting you in the poorhouse. You're not careful. I almost said anyway. The new restaurant I just opened down we were the old uh, okay. Anyhow, we went in and said she ordered a steak and we got a check. He said it wasn't good. He got his bill for seventy dollars for two people. <laughs> so that all I'm telling you what. God is concerned about your finances. We, we're living within a culture right now that's just totally out of control with finances. Starting with our government on down. You know, the Bible wants you to end up setting aside for a rainy day. 
And we're trying to tell people, no, you don't have to set aside for a rainy day because everybody already owes it to you. That's not biblical. The Bible teaches that you take responsibility for yourself and you live with the consequences of your decisions. Amen. I think we can do better than that. Amen. 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 Don't buy into this thing that everybody else owes you something within the society. You've got to take responsibility for the decisions that you're making. Listen, my son. I'm going to read these verses again. Listen, my son, and be wise. Come on, son. Get your brain working. Keep your mind on the right course. What's the right course, Dad? Well, the right course is be careful that you don't associate with those who drink too much wine or with those who gorge themselves on meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will become poor and grogginess will clothe them in rags. I do this from time to time with regard to finances. How much do you think that the average family maybe spends on fast food or restaurants during the course of the month? I'd say over a hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> said a hundred dollars and Becky says maybe a hundred dollars a week you think that maybe some families are spending a hundred dollars a week how much does that figure out for a year this is where I'm going with it you need to do long term on stuff how much does that come out a year fifty two hundred dollars a year how much does that come out over ten years fifty two thousand dollars how much does it come out to over twenty years Hundred and four thousand dollars. You ever do cost analysis on stuff? Yes, Miss Miss Bessie. Price keeps going up. <laughs> they do keep going up. Well, yesterday I I heard her busy in the kitchen. Well, I'm watching TV. I was next to her. A little bit. She said, "You like a piece of warm apple pie with ice cream." <laughs> You're all hard job. You are all hard job. <laughs> and I doubt that you would be willing to help out anybody else that needs help so that they don't get upset too, would you, Chuck? You know, the Bible is not opposed to us enjoying stuff. You know, we need to do stuff in moderation. We do. But the writer. Solomon is writing to his son and says, son, I'm, I'm just trying to tell you, where does Solomon get most of his wisdom from? Do you think that it's just he got this stuff stuck in his brain when he came into the world? God gave it to him. What about this? God opened your eyes so that you start paying attention. When Solomon got to watching people out there, he noticed which ones were driving the nice nice chariots and wagons and which ones were having to walk. He noticed the ones that ended up having the nice animals and the ones that had the bony ones. He noticed the people that had the nice clothes and the, did, the ones that didn't. And Solomon just tried to say to his son, hey son, I want you to pay attention. Pay attention because if you don't, you are the one 
that makes the decision about how your life turns out. I probably don't need to get fired up here, but I'm about ready to blow. <laughs> I am tired in our society of everybody wanting to blame everybody else for their situation and station in life. I watched a three-minute video last night about Herman King off of Prairie University. In fact, they said that there was a movie out there about him. It's over 30 minutes long. It's called Uncle Tom. But I really appreciate what Herman King said. Some of y'all remember that name here several years ago. He ran for president. It's a black man. Yeah. And he says, you know what? I don't use my race as an excuse. People, other people may want to use it as an excuse. But he says, I took responsibility for what my life was going to be. He was the one, I guess, the Godfather's chain and whatnot. Very intelligent man. I mean, it just from the three-minute clip that I watched, this was a man that ended up saying, I can't blame anybody else. I'm the one that makes the decision about what I do and what I become. Oh, now about ready to erupt. I'm tired of people that end up wanting to say, here's where the rubber meets the road. I don't have any money. Poor me. And they're probably lighting have, a cigarette. Have they, <laughs> have they examined? You're exactly right, Mary. It could have been on cigarettes. It could be on fast food. It could be on fast food. It could be on drinking it up. Yeah. I, I, I've heard this in there too. Maybe I should just keep my mouth shut. How much, how much soda pop do some people go through? You know, I, I drink almost all the time. Water. Why? I tell you, I've been drinking all my life. First off, when I was in seminary, y'all know a little bit about the story. When I was at down in Kentucky, seminary student, I lived on $100 a week. $5,200 a year. First three years that I was there. Then the, the new minister that came along, came along and said to me, he says, uh, when was the last time you had a raise? I said, I hadn't had a raise. So they gave me a raise, $3.75 a week. I didn't have a lot of money. I said to myself, do I want to? Drink it all up on sugary drinks. I can bake my own Kool-Aid, which I did a lot of making my own Kool-Aid and stuff like that. Or do I want to drink water? That's all that those sugary drinks are. They just have sugar and other stuff added to it. Flavorings. You know, if you're putting out What's, what's a fair thing to say? $10 a week on pop? I'm sure people drink a lot more than $10 a week on pop. $520 a year. 10 years time, $5,200. What could you do with $5,200? $10,400 every 20 years. What could you do with $10,000? Don't sit around and tell me I don't have any money if that's what you decide to spend, right? That's what you decide. Writer Potter says, son, I'm going to tell you what. Pay attention to people that drink too much, people that end up eating too much. They don't have anybody to blame but themselves. If they end up getting sluggish and they sit around, they develop all sorts of health problems, don't blame the person that made the food. Blame the person that stuck the food in their mouth. Right? <laughs> if you didn't make the pie, I would eat it. <laughs> and again, there is nothing wrong with us doing stuff in moderation to enjoy it. He does make the statement here, stay away from those, don't associate with those who drink too much. And by the way, I'm totally against alcohol. I mean, I, you mess around with that, we're going to get to that in one of these up. Next verse is description. But just stay away. It's a bike. Yes, sir. Uh, my mom uh, got me uh, the box of the 
go to package for a bottle of water, three the sweet tea or the or uh, grape and stuff. The box said it only have five calories, no sugar, no sodium. Yeah, they've, they've got a lot of artificial sweeteners out there, and that's open for another discussion. But I know that for me, whenever I get into stuff with all the flavorings and the sugars and stuff, it just makes me more thirsty. It honestly does. Nothing satisfies, quenches thirst, just like plain water. I know somebody say, I can't stand the taste of it. Give yourself time. Go over it. Period of time. It's just like a smoker. You know, at first they really crave getting the smell of those, the cigarette and stuff in their nostrils and they crave the chemicals and whatnot. And then after they've been around for a while, and I know one of the guys that we just had in our purpose, beef, quarter, charm quarter something. It's probably been close to 10 years ago that he decided that he would end up giving it up. And buddy, he battled it. But then about a month or two into it, he said, you know what? I'm starting to be able to smell stuff again. Yeah, I mean, when you basically cover up all of your, those taste buds or whatever and give you the ability to smell with all the other stuff, it's gonna affect everything. And the same is true with all the flavorings and stuff. I found that when I start drinking a lot of those stuff with artificial flavorings, it just makes me more thirsty. You say, what's the big deal then? Well, that just makes your kidneys work hard more stuff that you end up drinking. Your kidneys are the one that have to get all of that stuff out of your system. So, at any rate. Tim. Yes, sir. My dad was an alcoholic. And he would spend what he wanted to on, on alcohol. And my mom had to preach and say that he didn't get enough for us kids to have food. She made all of our clothes. And dad didn't. And he bragged about how much money he made, but he didn't bring very much home. Can people let me say, I am not against the alcoholic. I would hope that every alcoholic would say, you know what, if I had it to do all over again, I wish I'd have never got started. Because they have thrown away so much of their life. They've thrown away so much of their income. And you can't get it back. You can't get it back. It becomes more important than anything else. And that's the truth with not just alcoholism, but drug addicts. They will do anything to get that next fix, which gives them that physical high. They'll do anything. They'll steal. They'll even kill because they want it. They crave it so much. The bad thing is, they get it, and it doesn't last. You know, the alcoholic can drink that drink and it might give them a momentary kind of reprieve from whatever the, the nagging addiction is, but as soon as that wears off, they got to have another one. Um, not to... I think, you know, you, people, you talk about alcohol, you talk about everything there is, food, whatever. But sometimes, actually, a lot of that combined in the world
didn't matter. I had to get what I wanted and have the times I wanted. And my kids, I mean, all love, they love me. My wife loved me, but uh, I didn't think about that. You know, I didn't. And you know what? I, when I lost, I lost it all. I lost it all. I had a, an old car and a, a beat up trailer when I came back. And see, your story is exactly what Solomon is trying to warn his son against. Yeah. He's Solomon is basically saying, I know people that went down the road that Hank Vincent went on. And son, I'm trying to save you a lot of heartache and misery. Because in the end, you don't get ahead. Yeah, you don't. It'll make a mess of your life. You were blessed in that the Lord spared your life. I mean, you well, could have yeah. been killed any more than another time when you got scalped. Two or three times. Yeah. And so this is what's behind it. This is the wisdom. This is the wisdom that Solomon spent the first nine chapters trying to tell his son. Listen, son, pay attention to it. Because I'm telling you, if you hold on to this stuff, it will be a blessing to you in the long run. Page 87. We've got two more passages of scripture. Who would like to read that one out loud? I'll read it for you. Thanks, Hank. Who has wool? Who has tar? Who has conflict? Who has complaint? Who is, has wounds for it? No reason. Who has red eyes? Those who linger over wine, those who go looking for mixed wine. But no case at the wine because it is red, because it is clean in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and stings like a bite. And I personally view those first questions that Hank asked who has woe, who has sorrow, who has conflicts, who has complaints, who has wounds for no reason, who has red eyes? The person in the dreams. You want to multiply your problems? Start drinking. One of the favorite things that I heard Adrian Rogers say, Adrian Rogers, the pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church down in Memphis, Tennessee, he said, you see those commercials, drinking beer, and they show these beautiful girls, and they show these guys that are really muscular and fit and whatnot, and they'll end up seeing the commercial, it just don't get any better than this. You seen the commercial? Yeah. Adrian Rogers says, that is very true. That is a picture as, as good as it gets with these people and alcohol because from there on, it's all downhill. It is as good as it gets. When you start off that way, that ain't the way you end up. You end up with people that are drunk. People that have made a mess of their life. So if you want more woe, if you want more sorrow, does the alcohol take away the problems? It just covers them up. Then when those problems come back to the top, what happens? The person says, well, I need another drink to cover them up again. They spend their entire life trying to cover up the problems. And it doesn't work. You are treating the symptom. You're not treating the problem. You need to get it out, what those things are that you're struggling with. So... Don't gaze at the wine because it's red, because it moves the cup. It's like a viper. It will bite you. Last passage of scripture. Uh, Becky, would you please? Your Page 88. Eyes, your eyes will see They make a lot of sense, don't they? You'll be like what? You'll be like someone sleeping out at sea or lying down on the top of a ship's mast. Can you Imagine laying down there on the top of the ship's mast. Man, you're all over the place. You'll end up saying, hey, somebody struck me, but guess what? I feel good, Chuck. <laughs> they beat me, but I didn't know it. When can I wake up so I can look for another drink? Solomon is just saying, I'm not saying this to make fun. Solomon is saying to son, son, look, I'm trying to tell you, you better wise up before you get out there because it is a vicious world that we've got out there. We didn't really have a chance to go back to page 86, but I want to just kind of 
Have you look back here. Page 86. Down toward the bottom of that box. The next to last one. The alternative to drunkenness is to what? Capital S, not small s. Let me just ask you. What is what first off, what does it mean to be filled with the spirit? Capital S. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit of God? Can any girl ever say that? I know that Adrian Rogers ends up saying, we oftentimes talk about being filled with the Spirit of God. He he says that, you know what, when you got saved, you got all of the Holy Spirit that you're ever going to get. But he says this. The question is not if we're going to get more of the Spirit. The question is whether or not the Spirit is going to get more of us. That when the Spirit of God takes control of you, it is it is a high, what, what do we mean? The, the Holy Spirit takes control of us. Have any of y'all ever been in a worship experience and then you almost felt like you touched heaven? Maybe you felt that way when you got saved. Maybe it was a time of recommitment within your life. Maybe it's been during a, a really joyous worship service and you just end up feeling like you're right at the throne of God. The Word of God says, guess what? It's okay to be filled with that Spirit of God. Yes, Tom. Or like was in a good movie, and you see the Spirit of God right there in the movie. Absolutely. You see the Spirit of God there. Uh, I'll probably mention this, uh, well, I may or may not mention it in the service. Over in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were where? In prison. Singing praise. They were beaten to a bloody pulp. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit, not beaten to a bloody, bloody pulp, but that you are so close to God, nothing else in this world matters. People say, is that real? Is there really a, a, a joy that you can have in your relationship with God that you feel like that, man, oh man, I could almost deal with anything right now because it's such a wonderful feeling. That's what happens when you're filled with the Spirit of God. The writer of Hebrews says about Jesus, as Jesus went to the, went to the cross, says, for the joy that was set before him. He endured the pain, despised the shame, in order that he might do God's will. When you and I are filled with the Spirit of God, there is a oneness that takes place between us and God that nothing can separate. And it is well worth it. You and I can be filled with the Spirit of God or allow God's Spirit to fill us more as we stay in touch with Him and follow His instructions. That's the way that you end up experiencing God's blessings is when you end up doing what God has told you. And as you do it, you'll end up finding out, oh, guess what? God was right. God is good. All, All the time. time. All the time. God, God is, is good. good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's have a closing prayer. <laughs> Father, I don't know that with our group here that, you know, this particular lesson was one that we struggled with. Maybe with the eating, maybe not so much with the alcohol, but Father, your word has been giving us wisdom. Help us to use this wisdom. Not just to say, well, I remember studying about it. But your word does us no good if all we do is hear it and we don't follow what it says. The writer of James says, be you doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us to take your word to heart. We remember it. Help us to hide your word in our hearts so that we won't sin against you. More than just not sin against you. Help us to hide your word so that we will be blessed. Please keep us from those things that will destroy our lives and make life more difficult. Bless your word to our, our lives, us to your service, and use us for your glory. Bless now, Father, the service to follow. We just pray, Father, that your Son, Jesus Christ, might be lifted up because he is the one that we need, and we thank you for him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.